exactly. Nice. Well, cool. well, it's great to meet you. Thank you for taking a minute out today. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited to chat. Yeah, me too. So before we get into your life and, and social justice and education, I want to know four years ago, we were trying to figure this pandemic out. How long is it going to last? The ramifications, all of it. How did you survive and get through it? How did it change you? Great question. Um, gosh, I mean, just like everyone, I guess, you know, how I survived it was, it was just a situation of navigating um, the obstacles as they came, I guess, as, you know, someone in education, I thought a lot about how um, it would impact education and, and the ramifications for that. Um, and just like recentering on, on, you know, rethinking how we live our lives, how busy we all are, how much everything felt urgent before and then how often those things didn't feel urgent anymore or once we realized you know uh, you can't leave you can't go out all the things that felt so important and so necessary before actually weren't in many cases um so yeah i mean i guess that's kind of how it impacted me at the time i also lost um some people close to me and so you know it was a hard time it was a hard time for everyone um now looking back i mean i think a lot about over the past four years and as we continue the ramifications that have um that it has had and will continue to have on education and young people's experiences in schooling um i think is so important and then also of course the acknowledgement that that the virus hasn't gone away um and is still impacting folks today so yeah it's a lot yeah yeah and it seemed like america was the only place that always finds a way to throw gasoline on an inferno because George Floyd happened, there was all of these things yeah. that, you know, like it wasn't happening anywhere around the world, but somehow, you know, during that first summer, that was when all of the you know, marches happened and we have a virus that's spreading. You know, it was just very interesting to watch how that unfolded, especially from a social, social justice perspective. Um, so let's get to the heart and soul of what you do on a daily basis. I'm gonna put you in front of a bunch of third graders. It's career day. And one of the kids says, hey, what do you do for a living? How do you answer that child? Yes, yeah, so I would say I help uh, schools. I help teachers and parents and caregivers um, t teach kids about topics of social justice. So if they don't know what social justice is, I would say it's all about uh, creating a world where people are treated fairly and everyone um, is, is treated equal and equitable and gets what they need. Why can't we get that, not only as a country, but as a people? Why is this so hard? Gosh, I think it's hard because, I mean, as a country, it's hard because our country was built on a fundamental values of inequality. Uh, our, our country was built on, um, you know, views that some people were more valuable than others and so it's like how do you work within a system that was created with that at the core and how do you overturn that especially when so much of it has become invisible um, and in some cases purposely invisible uh, to so many folks in our country so I think within our country there's that I think when it comes to people and humans um, power naturally I don't know if it's natural I don't know if it's in our society you know we'd have to parse that out but people take advantage of power when people have power and they feel powerful um they often end up taking advantage or you know kind of becoming corrupt and like I said I don't know if that's human nature I don't know if that's how our society is functioning um but it's very very difficult to you know get an entire society of folks to genuinely be willing to sacrifice something for the greater good. It seemed like there was a time though, in my timeline of my life, where things were getting better. Incrementally, more rights were given to groups, like even now with women, like the war on women. And, and, and mm -hmm. the unfortunate thing that happens in the political arena is they've made it into abortion, but it's really about getting basic services and about squeezing yes. that out. And I don't mm -hmm. understand. It's almost like we've got no point where we've told Rosa to go back to the back of the bus. It feels like that. It feels like that. And I think... I think a lot of folks think that it is in some ways a backlash against 
the progress that was made. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, there, there's always been way more progress we need to make. But like you said, we, you know, things were moving forward, rights were being had, um, we were seeing some progress. And I think what we're seeing now is a complete backlash against that. And people standing up and saying, no, I don't want this country to change. I don't want things to be different. And so, you know, we have a lot of people in power who don't want anything to change and want it to be like it was in the past. And so um, they're kind of back rolling it. And it's it's hard to watch. It's hard to, to watch when so many incredible like activists have fought so hard for change. And then to see it be rolled back so quickly in so many instances is, it's hard. You know, another thing that I do is have a jazz radio show here in town, and I interview yeah. very prominent um, uh, African American. Uh, he's an older fella, and he's a really big champion for the arts. He's a he owns a yeah. record label. He's a saxophonist. And we were talking about the eight years of Obama, and mm -hmm. I had this feeling that there was a level of of leveling the playing field and rights and things that should have happened a long time ago, and basically from his perspective. All of the people that were against it just laid low and seethed. And then when they found somebody that was a new leader, so to speak, it just blew up. And I think that's the only way that any rational brain out there that doesn't like what we're seeing can see that that's what happened. It's like a total reversal and going against all of that progress because, man, it, it just seemed like having the first black president and having so many things that were being reversed that were that were anguishable from the previous eight years seemed mm -hmm. like we were on our way but it seems like all of that karma so to speak has just backfired yeah i mean i think going back to human nature i think people sometimes are waiting for permission to yeah. say what they're thinking i think for a long time um at least in most circles, it was it was pretty taboo. It was pretty frowned upon to you know speak against progress um, for a lot of folks. And you know when you are emboldened by a, a figure who and you know there are many honestly in our society. I think a lot of people speak about Trump, but um, now there are, there are a lot of folks who are yeah. who are leading this movement, and um, they you become emboldened. You become um, more willing to say what you think. Um, and at the same time, there's been a very conscious and intentional effort to infiltrate education systems, social media in ways that are um, bringing more people into those beliefs, even those who might have been a little more moderate or maybe just staying out of it in the past um, and are now, you know, there's this, this intentional effort to um, kind of turn those folks to against progress um i would say you're right that's totally something that is spot on it really is about kind of how we get information and how it swayed so much so mm -hmm. let's go back to when you were in the third grade what was your dream growing up what did you want to be uh i i was all over the place i wanted to be an artist or a teacher most days <laughs> so how did you get to this point? Take me back to where you were born and raised and mm -hmm. how social justice and educating people, how did this become kind of your your fuel in life? Yeah, so I was born and raised in Ohio. Um, and I can say that I probably never heard the term social justice until at least I was in college. Um, so I certainly wasn't kind of raised with any uh, any of this in my life um i did i was always drawn to um to justice what i would call justice now um and thinking about injustices and how they played out in society but i was never taught about it i never ever learned about it at school um or from the adults in my life and it wasn't until you know college when i even started thinking about um you know, for example, privilege and identity and how that played out in society. And so, and that was my privilege, obviously, as a white person growing up in Ohio, um, you know, being able to kind of ignore uh, a, lot, a lot about justice as a white, um, non-disabled uh, person. And so um, it wasn't until, like I said, after college, when I really started to think more about justice, um, I got into work in education and running after school programs and became a school psychologist and, um, or sorry, not a school, uh, yeah, a school um, counselor. And through that work, I um, 
started to, I guess, learn more. And then I went back to get my PhD in education at UCLA and again, continuing to learn more about how our education systems are set up, the inequity in that, and just how, how society um, works. And I really regretted not learning about it sooner. And I know that it's hard to change people's minds as adults. And, um, but we don't want to talk about these topics with kids, but the problem is they're learning about it, whether we're talking about it to them or not. Um, they're picking it up. They're learning it from society. They're learning it from social media. And so, you know, we're going to continue to create generations of, of kids who grow up to be biased adults um, if we don't make a conscious effort to reverse that. Yeah. So who's been a hero for you? Who's been an inspiration in your work? Great question. And there are so many. Um, one who I can really point to uh, was an early mentor for me. Um, her name was Dr. Patty Cunningham uh, she, at Ohio State when I was doing my undergrad. She um, supported me through starting a nonprofit organization. Uh, when I was young, she was so supportive. She was so committed to justice in every way. And um, it was inspiring. And she also educated me, um, you know, as a Black woman who had been in activist spaces way longer than I ever had. Um, she educated me and she took the time that wasn't her responsibility to do. I'm so grateful for her that she did. She also wrote my letters of recommendation uh, for my PhD program. Um, and sadly, she passed away while I was getting my PhD. Um, wow. And, but I'm so grateful to her because she came in at a time when I had this desire to do something meaningful and, and good, hopefully in the world. Um, but I did not have the experience, the knowledge, um, the the information that I needed to do it. And like I said, it wasn't her responsibility, but she was a mentor to me and she took the time to help me learn, help me grow um, and support me through it. And I'll just be forever grateful for that. So of all of the social justice heroes that exist in, in the history of our country and even the world, Who's your favorite? What's what's the one the one person that you look up to the most? That's such a tough question because there are so many people I admire. Um, but if I had to pick one, let me think. Gosh, this is difficult because I just value so many amazing activists who have come before. Um, there could, be, one, there could be top three or five if you want. Yeah, I'm like, there's so many. I, I guess one I will say, like, um, that I think a lot of folks uh, look up to Maya Angelou, um, yeah. just the way she used art um, to express ex art and writing to express um, social change, I think is, is such a powerful way to connect with people and, and get people to understand things that are so far outside the realm of their worldview. Um, and I really appreciate literature as kind of a window into experiences of others for which really helps us develop empathy. So I, I would I would say uh, Maya Angelou. So if you can meet anybody alive on the planet right now that you find mm -hmm. inspirational or fascinating, who would it be? Who would you love to spend time with? I would love to spend time with Michelle Obama, mm -hmm. um, just because I think well, one, I think she's an incredible activist in her own right, um, but I think having the experience of having been the first lady of the United States has so much insight into what we were talking about before, kind of the the politics of power and the the way that our governments work and the way that even good people, I think, can get caught up in um bad systems. And I I would really be interested to kind of hear from from that perspective about um, just so many questions about activism and politics and um, what what it looks like from the inside. Yeah. And I, I listened to her book and I, mm -hmm. she's definitely not going to run for anything. I, I don't see her right in political office. So yeah. And I can't blame her. I read the book as yeah. well. I can't can't blame her. Uh -huh. um, yeah. And yet, I just think we need we need so many more folks with good hearts to be yeah. doing this. Yeah. So let me ask you this. You obviously are in a position where you have to give a lot of yourself and you're dealing with heavy issues. Mm -hmm. But you also has, have to evolve as a human being. Where do you find that balance between 
taking care of these issues that affect the globe and that can really bring change requires a lot. And to mm -hmm. also develop yourself on a cellular level as a human. Yeah, that's such a good question. And I think um, I would say some sometimes in social justice, it can feel like you you can't give anything to yourself because there's there's always so much to do. There's always so much work to be done. Um, yeah. And yet I think like in my view of what justice means, like one of the core tenets of that is caring for ourselves as human beings, like recognizing that. And I think so many of the people I work with recognize rest and um, self-care as, as vital and um, as, you know, actually tools of, of fighting against the systems that are oppressing so many folks. And so I'm just, I'm lucky to be able to work with people who truly value those things. So I don't feel as much pressure, I think, as a lot of people do to, you know, respond to emails within an hour or, you know, schedule a meeting every time someone wants to chat or something like that. So I try really hard to kind of set boundaries for myself and make sure that the work that I'm doing, like, still is aligned with who I am as a person. So like, I think in activism, so many people get into the sense of like, I must be protesting or I must be posting on social media or I must be writing letters, um, you know, to government officials. But like, there's so many ways to do it. Like I talked about, there's art, there's writing, um, there's, you know, educating like how I do. Um, there's collaborating and there is protesting and there's, you know, creating a platform. There's so many ways. And I think the world be, would be better if we all tried to do it in our own way, um, in the way that makes sense for us. And I think for me, that keeps me going more because I'm not forcing myself to do things that are I mean, sometimes uncomfortable, but like, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm trying to to use my strength, to use my natural skills um, to, to push forward change. And I hope other people do that in their way. And then we have folks working on it from all angles, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it's like anything. It's like, it's a collective synergy. I mean, yes. even if you looked at like a White House, you gotta have the cooks, you gotta have the people that clean, you gotta have the people that are assistants, mm -hmm. it, or even at the end of a film, there's like a thousand people. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, and that's what it should be. Yeah. Yeah, but all of that effort goes towards one thing. And if yes. that's done in earnest, I think it's gonna be hugely beneficial. Um, so let me ask you this, of, of all of the things that you've done and accomplished on a professional timeline, mm -hmm. what's one of your favorite success stories? Yeah, so my favorite success stories are always when I hear from teachers, parents, or kids who have been impacted by our resources. So um, for example, there was this uh, third grade girl um, and her teacher told me that they were doing a unit on pronouns and um, gender identity and that we had created. And in that unit, um, that young girl for the first time in her you know, elementary school career saw her sibling represented in the materials they were using in the classroom. So she had a non-binary sibling um, and she had struggled to talk about her sibling with her friends because they didn't necessarily understand how to use they, them pronouns um, or, you know, how to how to talk about a non-binary person or what that even meant. Um, and this girl expressed to her teacher how significant it was to um, see someone who you know looked like her sibling in the books that they were reading and the lesson that they were doing and also not just that but also that all of her friends saw that all of her classmates learned that lesson and so now she could speak more freely about her family and they understood and that to me was like such a perfect example of why we do what we do so that um everyone sees themselves, their families represented um, in what they see in school. Um, and, you know, to open the minds of the, the 25 other kids in the classroom who, who had never experienced that. And now we're going to be kinder, more understanding, more empathetic um, when, when they did, you know, meet someone or, you know, in that case, when their classmate had a sibling who was non-binary. So, you know, both of us actually are in a position here where we're in states that are going to decide the election. Ohio, yep. Missouri is very key. Exactly. And we're heading towards November. We've come out of this pandemic. Do you do you think that we're entering an age of enlightenment or are we in one? Where, where do you see us as a people going? Yeah, I'm nervous, but hopeful. Um, not necessarily about the election. I, I can't say I'm hopeful about the election. I, I don't think it's 
um, going to go great either way, but um, I am not convinced that we are in an age of enlightenment yet. Um, I, unfortunately, like I want to say I'm, I, I am hopeful for the future. I'm very hopeful for the future. Working with young people will make you that way um, because they are incredible, but um, I am not convinced that that it's happening this year. I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Like you said, in the last, I would say eight years or so, uh, we've seen a lot more hate um, come out, a lot more uh, blatant hatred and, and bias and racism and xenophobia um, and misogyny. But, and I think it will take time to to move past that. I really, to, or to be able to not only like, you know, reverse the, the, the trend of backwards progress that I feel like we're we're making, but also um, to move us forward to where we need to be. I, I think it's, unfortunately, I hope I'm wrong, but I think it might be a while. Yeah, I, I think that's probably the case. So let me ask you this. If you have a dream tonight, you run into an 18-year-old version of you, mm -hmm. and you can give that young version of you a piece of advice based on all the work you've done, the wisdom you've gained. What advice would you give your younger self? And would that version of you listen? Great question. I think um, what I would give myself or really any young person um, would be be more open. I think at 18, we are so inclined to think we know what's going on. We think we have a plan for our life. We think we know what we're going to do with our life. Um, I never would have pictured where I'm at now when I was 18. I thought I was going to be a psychologist. Like I was on a completely different path. And I think just be open, be open to where life is going to take you, be willing to change your plan, be open to changing your mind because you are not right about everything and you do not understand how everything works. Um, honestly, I could say this to most people at most ages, including myself. Um, would I have listened? I, I like to think I would have. I was a pretty, um, I think, eager to learn young person I, I was. Um, so I want to think I would have listened, but also I probably wouldn't have understand understood you know, the depth of the importance of it without having gone through the experiences that I have. Yeah. So of all of these things that you've done and accomplished and evolved into, what are you the proudest of? So I'm definitely the proudest of, like I said, like stories that I hear of parents and teachers and young people and how our resources have impacted them. Um, but I guess, you know, I also want to say I am proud of of myself and the evolution that I've been through because I do think um like I said I, I didn't learn about these things growing up um and I wasn't surrounded by people who were talking about justice and um racial justice gender justice none of that and so the, yeah, it's been a long road for me it's been a lot of learning a lot of unlearning a lot of unraveling like how I thought the world worked how I thought things were supposed to be, and that's a process for anyone. So I would say I am proud of that, and I am so grateful for all the people I see going through this process, like alongside me, um, you know, younger people now and people who have done it before me. Um, I think that that is something to be proud of. So at the end of the day, everyone has a perception of you, family, friends, clients, but you run the show. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? Gosh. I'm still figuring that out every day, I think, um, as maybe we all are, at least if we're being honest with ourselves. Um, but, you know, at this moment, I, you know, at my core, I see myself as as an educator, um, hopefully as a change maker, or at least an inspiring change maker. Um, and and also, I just try to see myself as a human, like I'm just a person trying to learn, trying to do better, um, trying to connect and be in relationship with people. And all of those things matter too. So it really is kind of this holistic, like I'm just a person and also I'm a person who cares about these things and that defines a lot of who I am. So if anyone wants to reach out, learn more about what you're doing, do their own social work, get out there and find justice, yes. how do they do that? Yes, so um, you can learn more about our work at our website, littlejusticeleaders.com. Um, but, you know, really, if you want the resources, the best stuff is going to be um, on our Instagram for free. So we give out tons of free information. So if you are super interested in justice and you're an activist or you're just kind of curious and want to learn more or you have kids and you want to start these conversations, uh, we have resources for all of that uh, at Little Justice Leaders on Instagram and the same thing on our um, email list. So 
you can access our email list at ljl.education slash famous interviews. We created that link for this. So ljl.education slash famous interviews. Um, you'll get tons of resources. We have a guide for talking to kids about current events. So it's a nine step framework. Uh, if your kid asks, you know, something about what's going on in the world and you don't know how to respond. Um, we also have like 10 tips for teaching about social justice and then just lots of resources we send every week um, that, you know, hopefully will help you as a person learn more about justice and your role in it. Um, but also if you're an educator or parent, for sure, like guide those conversations. Excellent. Shelby, this is wonderful. Your, your work is, is instrumental in, in helping not only now, but into the future. So thank you. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your story today. Thank you so much, Joe. You bet. Best of luck.